Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the William Bonney Weekly Podcast. Uh, today we have a look at the prison officer gone bad, um, prison officer Lee Davis. He was the one that got caught bringing in phones and drugs and things um, for inmates. Uh, you may have seen a video, I think I shared it on my Instagram. Um, so anyone who's not following my Instagram, um, please go and follow me, William Bonney 838 on Instagram. I actually uh, show my face uh, sometimes on there. So um, yeah, drop me uh, a little follow on there. Um, so yeah, you may have seen him on uh, on the Lab Bible recently. He's done about a 20 minute interview. It's, it is a pretty good one. Um, it is pretty moving and, and really, really honest. So anyone who hasn't seen that, have a look in the description um, for, for that link. And also... I remember, I think he did a video, I know he did a video, he's on about three of, three of them, I think, um, where he talked to Sam, the ex-prison officer, and uh, uh, they're very honest, very in-depth on why, what happened, and, you know, he goes into great detail about what happened before and after, um, you know, doing this, uh, bringing phones in for the boys, so, um, today I just thought I'd I'd kind of react and, and run through my thoughts and, and what happened in this video, and, you know, like I say, an inmate's point of view from... From the point of inmate who who did used to have a prison officer who brought stuff in for him, you know, I when I was in Exeter looking at life, I was in there with a the Scouse gang, um, and they'd already turned an officer, um, and as they kind of you know got sentenced and moved away, um, there was a few occasions where he did bring in stuff you know solely for me. Um, I paid him, you know, we used to pay him about three hundred and fifty quid a time back then. Um, you know, we're talking about two thousand and eight. You know, no, it wasn't even then. It was about two thousand seven. Yeah, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, sometimes something like that. So it's about you know a week's wage um, for you know just you know shoving a parcel down your pants. And uh, yeah, as far as I know, he could still be an officer there. So you know, obviously, we won't be mentioning any names. Um, but yeah, it isn't as difficult as you think to get somebody to uh, to work on the side. Um, so yeah, we'll just go through what he explains in his, in his story. So you know, first of all, Lee goes into you know explaining his his training really wasn't substantial enough. Um, they didn't prepare him for facing the wing for the first time. Now I can completely understand that. I've seen other documentaries and you know and other TV shows where they're taking just normal guys from the street and turning them into prison officers, and the, you know the training is just in classrooms and you know there's other officers there pretending to be inmates you know banging a banging a chair on the ground and stuff and pretending to kick off and you know and then they get restrained and shit and it's it's completely unrealistic um day one the first thing they should do is go and walk them on the wing go and take them through the wing on association time when it's wild you know or on the landings when everyone's running down because it's gym um and the you know the landings are banging because it's you know this thunderous noise and everyone's shouting and trying to get their names and pushing to the front of the queue and shit um yeah, to get people in to see what it's like when it's wild on the wings and when it's normal, because that's that's a normal Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> like, you know, it looks like a riot to someone on their first day, but it's you know that's just people going to the gym, um, and it's pretty mental. And even just you know, as people come out for work and they're all shouting, and you know, it's, it's just noise. Um, there's a lot of noise on the wing that you're just not used to and you're not familiar with, and you've got you know, being a prison officer on a wing, you probably got between maybe 50 to 100 interactions before lunch you know what what other job do you have that or whatever time in your life are you going to have that many interactions with with people who let's face it are you know are going to be difficult and hard and are criminals in society so you've always got to be on your toes for what's going on so yeah no no i don't uh i don't i don't envy them at all um so yeah he's, he's going into how his uh, his training wasn't any good he ended up at lancaster farms um, which is a, a YOI, which is, you know, for people who don't understand, it's a, it's a Young Offenders Institute, so that holds people who are 18 to 21. Um, so in, in my instance, that would be Portland, that's where I was, um, and it was wild there, so I don't doubt for one second that it was a pretty gnarly place to be. Um, he felt pretty scared because of the uh, the gangs from Manchester and Liverpool. Um, I've been in prison again with, you know, gangs from these places, and it's again, it's wild, it's machetes, it's shotguns, it's... It's proper criminals um, who can turn up at your house uh, if you fuck about. So, um, yeah, he said his first 18 months were no problem. Um, and then after that, he started drinking quite heavily um, due to the stress. He said it was horrible. Again, that's going to be mental, you know, spending that much time. You know, I, I did I did probably two years in the Young Offenders, and it, and it probably still affects me to this day. Um, 
you know, 20 years later. So I can completely understand that it's uh, affected him at the time. And he said he was, you know, drinking heavily. Um, he said that the way he got turned was that one of the prisoners said that his, uh, his dad was ill and he was crying on the bed, um, requested that Lee bring a phone in. Um, and even Lee says himself, that at that point, you know, you should have gone and report it. And that's the first thing I was thinking is, you know, you've got to go and report that. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's, it's 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 what's known as kind of a check. It's, it's putting your foot in the water to see what you do. Um, and uh, because he did nothing, they then kept it on. You know, carried on asking him, and then they started offering him cash. Because if you can't if you can't pull on someone's strings emotionally, then you you have to look for their next weakness. Um, and it's either going to be cash, drugs, or women. You know, or men, or you know, little boys. Um, but uh, it's. Uh, Lee stopped at the cash, spinning the wheel. And after, I think about the second time of offering him for about 400 quid, he accepted it. And uh, he talks about how he went and met some, uh, a couple of lads in a car and they chucked him in a, you know, a phone and they chucked him in, you know, 400 quid in, in notes. Now I've, um, you know, I've taken part in these kind of drug deals where they just kind of throw stuff in through the, the window and things. And that's exactly how it happens. Um, the way when we had a prison officer, we would uh, we would get stuff to, dropped off at his house. Um, you know, we would have the address, and either my associates from the southwest would take the scousers' drugs over there, or you know, we would supply the drugs, and the scousers would go over there and uh, and drop it off. Um, but yeah, doing stuff in car parks and that sort of shit is risky because you're bound to have some sort of fucking have a go hero who spots you when they're out bird watching or some shit. Um, now it, he said he led to him doing about a thousand quid just for two parcels now can you imagine that a thousand pounds for t- bringing in two parcels imagine if you just had to try and sneak something into your workplace um, and there's no real checks you know there's no real stopping and searching you and all you had to do was smuggle something in to a prison and uh, you got a thousand pounds for two parcels that's that's the best part of a month's wage for uh you know, for fucking two mornings work. And this is the temptation of the drugs world, is, you know, these, you're getting large sums of money for very little work. It's very, very tempting, um, especially if in you're in the right frame of mind. So you might be feeling that life's kicking you in the nuts a little bit. You might be feeling that you deserve better. You know, you might be feeling that you've, you know, you've worked really hard and you're in a dead-end shitty job and then someone offers you quite a, you know, a lot of money for something that you can do quite easily. Um, and it takes a very strong man to um, to you know to refuse that. And obviously, these criminals it's, it's their job all day to just keep pecking. You know, they they could have offered four other pr- uh, prison officers that deal, and they've all knocked him back. But because Lee didn't report it in the first instance, and I've talked about this over and over again, it's the same with it's the same with inmates. Um, when when someone shouts to you out the window, you know, and they're like, "Oh, next door, next door, come to your window." And if you don't come to the window and if you don't banter with people and if you can't hold your own at the window, then the next morning someone's going to be coming around and they're going to be trying to bully you. Um, and because Lee, the prison officer, didn't report that in the very first instance, that's why it basically gave them a green light that, you know, he can be turned. Um, you've just got to work out how and why. So, yeah, he said um, he became a bit of a recluse once he started bringing in the parcels. You know, he's kind of... Uh, Lost, lost who he was, lost focus of who he was, started becoming a recluse, didn't really see his family and friends. Um, he was saying there's no real support as a prison officer, which I can understand again. Um, I imagine you've got to, you know, create your own kind of community as a prison officer. Um, you know, you've got to create your own support. But again, is that going to be negatively based all around the pubs and, you know, just going out of, going out of work and drinking, you know, that sort of thing, which isn't, isn't good. Um, so again, it did. It, it kind of surprised me that there was no real support for um, for them if they were feeling, you know, uh, a bit down. Um, and then one day, inevitably, as it all happens, um, you know, we've seen it in that really good documentary. No, it wasn't a documentary, was it? That really good drama series um, with uh, with Sean Bean. You know, eventually, you get that tap on the shoulder and you get asked to go into the office. Um, and there's the dogs and the the search team there, and. Uh, he had the parcel on him, he handed it over, and he kind of said he felt relieved, which was interesting, because he must have been feeling so much pressure. He'd been doing this for a year, two parcels a week for a year, 
Um, bearing in mind, like I say, you got nearly a grand for two parcels. So we're talking like 50 grand, uh, 50 odd grand in cash. So if he was doing that as a job, what are we talking about? 70 grand, 70 grand a year wage. If you're going to do that legit, who gets that? You know? Yeah, very, very tempting. Um, yeah, he said he was happy it was over and uh, he kind of felt relieved it was all done. He got obviously got arrested. Um, he went down to the, the police station. He's got the, uh, you know, he's still got his prison gear on. Um, and the inmates, you know, the lads in the prison police cells kind of catch sight of him through the door and they think he's a policeman getting banged up. So they were giving him shit through the doors and stuff, which is legitimate. You know, that happens if, uh, you know, if, if one of their own gets caught. <laughs> um, he was on bail for a year really got into drink and drugs so that would explain where that extra 50 grand went because you know you've got to do something with that money it's all sat there in shoeboxes it's difficult to spend because it's difficult to spend more than 1100 quid in cash without it getting reported um so yeah you find it very 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 hard trying to spend cash um in a lot of places eventually you get sentenced got four years uh similar to me uh, I think because he's quite late in that, you wouldn't have even had to do parole then. You would have just been getting out of the two years' time. Um, now, what I found interesting, he kind of like dusted over it a little bit. Um, and this is probably because, if you're being honest with yourself, um, if he was being honest with himself, he knew that the prisoners absolutely hated him. The, the, the interviewer said, you know, how did the inmates feel having a prison officer amongst them? Um he would have only been on the protection wing and uh, if he went on the main wing they would have killed him so he would have only been on the protection wing and on the protection wing you've got rapists paedophiles grasses policemen and uh, and prison officers you know and so getting respect from this kind of category of prison of prisoners is you know it's not it's not something that you need to worry about. A lot of them in there aren't going to be starting to slice someone up because he's a prison officer, because they're in there for fucking being a nonce themselves. So it's you know there's no there's no there's no honour amongst these um, the wing that he would have been on, essentially. If he'd been on a main wing, he would have been killed. Um, it's uh, there's no real there's no real question about it. So. Um, he tells a story that I, I, I heard him tell to Sam as well. Um, and it's a story that I've got an opinion on. So I'll, I'll tell it to you again. He's um, in the prison he's in. It's an open prison. And uh, he's working in the, uh, the sort of central area where they do all the applications and shit. And he goes to his cell. Um, his cellmate is a police officer. Um, his cellmate was a bent police officer who used to steal the uh, drug dealers sort of parcels and things. You know, he'd still, he'd still sort of cash and drugs um, after he'd do a bust. And, and that's happened to me. And it's, it's mo so much more common than you think. Uh, one time I had uh, CID searching my property and I had money hidden behind the sink uh, in, the, in the bathroom. And uh, while I was sat on the sofa, you know, a member of CID went off into the bathroom to go and search, came out, said he didn't find anything. After the police had gone, um, I went to go and search behind the, uh, the sink and uh and my money had gone so uh you know obviously he'd taken it and just pocketed the money um there's about you know i think it was about six seven hundred pound there um and he'd just taken the money and gone so uh yeah you know it's just one of those things it's it's you know it's just life really um it wasn't uncommon that you know the police would be shitbags as well so um yeah lee sat in the cell and uh, his cellmate's uh, a police officer who's, who's bent um these two lads come down and they tell Lee that they know he's a prison officer. Um, so he's like, all right. And uh, they said, but they're not worried about that. They're more worried about doing in the uh, his cellmate, who's the policeman. They said uh, not to be around, you know, just make himself scarce. Be out, be out of the cell that night because, uh, you know, they're going to fucking, they're going to do him. And they kind of make the motion that, you know, going to, you know, going gonna to stab him. They make the kind of stabbing motion. Now, um... Lee then says that he, you know, he, he pitches his family, you know, obviously, you know, you show a cell, you kind of get to know someone. Uh, Lee already knew that he was a police officer. Um, and uh, I think he mentions that, you know, there being another few, you know, police officers and, or, you know, prison officers, you know, about. Um, 
and he says he, he sort of sees his daughters and things and he's got a family on the outside. Uh, now, this is where I kind of differ from him because what Lee did is he went and told the staff and uh, they both ended up getting shipped out. Now, what happened when Lee told the staff is he ended up losing the, in his place in the DCAT prison. So he lost his course where he was going to become an electrician. You know, he wanted to become an electrician outside. So he lost his place on the college course. Um, he would have been getting probably benefits from being, you know, in a DCAT prison. You know, he might have been getting home leaves, you know, town visits, that sort of thing. Uh, a DCAT prison is a way more relaxed environment. Um, there's alcohol, there's drugs about if you want. Hardly any prison officers. The doors rarely get locked. You know, there's there's hardly any officers around. You know, you can do your own thing. You know, it's it's a different world compared to, uh, you know, even being in a CCAT prison. So he put all of that at risk uh, by protecting this cellmate that he didn't even really know that well, in my opinion. Um, I certainly wouldn't have done it. You know, if someone came to tell me that my cellmate was going to get stabbed that night, I would have just made myself scarce. It's not my problem. Um, and I would have lived with that because at the end of the day, you just got to think, is it is it going to happen? Or are they testing you to see what you're, you know, what you're about? Um, in my eyes, that was a test to see if he was going to tell the staff, um, to see if he could be trusted, really. Um, and obviously, Lee being the person he is, uh, he he put that integrity aside and put the prison, uh, the uh, the policeman that he was in the cell with, sort of first. Um, in my eyes, that he's not my problem. And I don't know if he would have done the same for you. Um, I mean, talking about you being Lee, I don't know if the police officer, if they'd come to the police officer, would he have told Would he have told Lee? Um, I don't know. That's an interesting one. Um, I'd be interested to know in the comments what you kind of think about that. Uh, me personally, like I say, I thought it was a test. I, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have said anything. Um, I certainly wouldn't have. I may have gone and told the police officer. I may have told him to get his guard on and to uh, to be ready tonight. But I also would have said... It's not my problem, and I'm going to be downstairs playing pool on camera, uh, making sure that it's uh, it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> and I might have picked up picked up some of my valuable stuff out of the cell, um, just so it didn't get fucked up. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's not something I would have got involved in, and it's and it's generally not something you do get involved in unless you know it's part of your team. You know, if he's your best mate, then you you, you two sit in the cell, you wait, you get weaponed up, you know, you put a few magazines down your trousers to kind of work as a bit of a stab vest. Um, that's why you see inmates put a towel around their neck um, to stop any, uh, you know, to stop anybody being able to stab them around the neck as well. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, you get ready and you and you rumble. But yeah, it was a test to see if he would have, uh, if he was going to grass. And unfortunately, he did. Um, in in Sam's podcast, he goes on to great detail to kind of tell you what happens after that. Um, in the uh, in the in the in the lab bible episode they kind of go to a you know life on the outside and and this is where me and him we kind of mirror our lives really because we both leave prison we've both got a record and we both try and make it in the world we both try and go straight um and we both faced very similar um very similar obstacles in the fact that you know if you you know if you don't declare your record you're always running the risk of it coming and biting you on the ass and you getting sacked. And if you do declare your record, then why the fuck are they even going to give you an interview, let alone, you know, there's 10 people there without, you know, a prison record uh, going for the job. Why the fuck are they going to give you? Um, and let's face it, you got prison um, for being dishonest with your employer at the end of the day. Um, so why are they going to suddenly trust you in, in any walk of life now? Um, so this is the fucking dilemma you have. Do you, do you declare it and definitely don't get the job? Or do you not declare it and maybe not get the job? Now, from my own personal point of view, I've never declared it. Um, and most of the time it's worked out. It's only been very, very recently that I've uh, uh, I lost out on a job opportunity and quite a good job, op job opportunity um, because of my extensive criminal record. Um, but it's the only time it's ever held me back. Um, Lee goes on to talk about how he got into a, you know, a job that he really enjoyed. Um, and then one day they come and get him. Uh, similar to uh, similar to when he was in uh, in the prison, he gets that tap on his shoulder, and uh, you know, obviously, these you know the, the work knows about his print, um, his criminal record, and, and the fact that he hadn't declared it on his applications and and you know his paperwork, so he ends up losing that job. Um, 
and uh, you know it's it, it it just mirrors everything you know going back into prison or just going back onto where back onto Civvy Street again. Um, you got to start from scratch a lot when you come out of prison. You know, scratch has to be your new best mate. Um, you know, you start from the bottom so many times that uh, you know you just got to get used to it. Um, unfortunately, Lee, as you know. You know, I, I talk about in my diary podcast about being so low after being um, taken back to prison so quickly, you know, thinking about suicide and, and almost attempting it. But um, Lee actually looks like he went went through that attempt and he was quite lucky that somebody found him and, uh, you know, and he was able to um, to pick himself back up again and, and, you know, move on, move on with his life. And, and like I say, you know, through Sam's interviews and through this lab, Bible, <coughs> excuse me, lab Bible interview, We've, uh, you know, I've managed to sort of learn a bit more about him, and um, it's a very difficult circumstance, isn't it? The, the money involved in drug dealing was was just as attractive to me as it was to him, you know. Whether it be, you know, I used to run drugs from one town to another for for six hundred pounds at a time, you know, back earlier than this. This was kind of, you know, back in the early two thousands. So, you know, in two weeks, I was earning a monthly wage just from sitting on a train for two days out of that, you know, two weeks. It's so tempting um, to then just sit in the pub for the rest of the time, celebrate cocaine, beer, you know, living the life of Riley. No no responsibilities, no bosses. And all you've got to do is go and pick up a rucksack every now and then. And, uh, yeah, it seemed to be a very similar to the temptation that Lee went through working in a prison. And all he had to do was go and shove a, uh, a parcel down his pants and uh, and then go and live the life he wanted to, but he ended up losing it all. Very similar to what I did. Lost his girlfriend. Lost his other girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> lost his family. Lost his career, and lost a big chunk of his life. Um, it took me about ten years to get over being in prison, um, and it's still only just letting go of its grasp on me now. And it seems to have had a similar. You know, I think Lee says he. You know, it took him about eleven years to get over it all. Um, it's very very difficult. You know. Not, first of all, getting over that life that you live when you have tons of money and drugs and and everything, uh, going through prison, um, but then the the difficulty of getting through life on the outside as well. So um, yeah, I'd love to know what you think. Give give his videos a watch, and uh, I know he's on on uh, Instagram as well. So yeah, just let us know what you think, and um, what would you do if you was in his boots and someone offered you that kind of money. Um, yeah, what would you do? Like, subscribe, do everything that uh, YouTube likes, and, and come and find me on Instagram, William Bonnie eight three eight. You know, it makes sense. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers.